So I'm not sure if anyone in the U.S. has heard yet. I hope tons of you have, but Draper Startup House is officially here in the United States. Our first location is in Austin, Texas. We are right in the middle of 6th Street, so make sure you come and visit us next time you're here. We are not open for business yet as our timeline got pushed back a little bit with everything happening in the current ecosystem um, and really the world, but we hope to be open uh, and operational in the next couple months. So make sure you stay updated on everything we're doing here at draperstartuphouse.com. For our next speakers, we have Tito Jankowski and Ari Gentry. They are friends and co-founders who made a pack to work on the world's biggest problems. Their focus has been on climate change and they launched Negative, a carbon negative consumer brand. When they heard about the COVID crisis, they were working on mobilizing people to take climate action into their own hands. They quickly pivoted their time and energy to building the COVID accelerator. Join them now for a panel with five of their startups for a round table style discussion. For our next speakers, we have Tito Jankowski and Ari Gentry. They are friends and co-founders who made a pact to work on the world's pivoted their time and energy to build the this COVID accelerator and then launch negative, a carbon negative consumer brand. Hey everybody. Hi. Hi. My name is Ari and I'm going to tell you about COVID accelerator. So on March 12th with my longtime friend and collaborator, Tito Jankowski, we created an accelerator out of thin air. So yes, in less than three weeks, it's launched new solutions, actually some new companies that are all tackling the COVID pandemic. So today we're gonna to hear from five project leads who became supercharged in a crisis. So they are the amazing heroes that are changing this world that we're living in. But I wanna back up for a sec and tell you the story about how this happened. So. Before all this, Tito and I, we were working on climate solutions. We'd started this company, it's called Negative, and it's a carbon negative consumer brand, which probably makes your mind spin a little bit. What's that? So we make physical consumer products like jewelry or home goods out of carbon dioxide that's been pulled out of the air. So we were actually working on fulfilling our first big order when the first cases of COVID hit the shores. So I think a lot of you can probably relate to what happened next with us. Um, you know, we were reading the news constantly. We were panicking. We felt hopeless. We were pretty scared. And then we were like, oh, we have to pep ourselves up again. And the cycle kept continuing. Um, and it did until we realized that, you know, we are entrepreneurs, we're problem solvers. And how we get to that state is that we listen. So. That was our job and that's every good entrepreneur's job is to listen to what's happening around you. And that's what we did. We heard there weren't enough tests that we weren't prepared and that a lot of us could get sick and die. But there was this other side of it too. We were hearing from our friends, these amazing people we love, super smart engineers, scientists, designers, all kinds of people that they wanted to do something. You know, and we did too but it felt like there was some blocker. It was a lot of fear and it was uncertainty. You know, what are we supposed to be doing? What can anybody do? This is a crisis. But I think you know by now the punchline that this is what entrepreneurs do. They get over fear and uncertainty. That's part of the job. And that's why there's even such a thing as entrepreneurs is because you take that risk and you make sense out of the chaos. Um, so we really leaned into that and we leaned into the power of our community of people and we borrowed this accelerator concept from the startup world and built a virtual community where fledgling ideas could be shared and they could be nurtured and launched to fight the pandemic that we're all in together so covid accelerator it helps to connect ideas to teams and then to resources like micro grants and pr and the amazing thing is, is that it's been working. And that's important because right now, there's never been a more important time to get solutions launched. So let's get into that. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna pass it off to Tito Jankowski. He'll moderate a conversation with the first set of graduates from COVID Accelerator. You're going to hear from Paul about starting Corona Care card to serve small businesses. 
from Yi Ying about how design has been totally transformed in a crisis, from Nana or Dr. A, as she is better known in the ER, about getting tests to tens of thousands of patients, from Keith about how Hospital Hero is serving our most vulnerable healthcare workers, from John about how Fine COVID Jobs is taking care of people's livelihoods, so many of which have been lost, and Tessa on the surprising coincidences and new ventures that she's found amid COVID. So pass it off to Tito. Hey, everybody. Uh, let's see, can you see this screen that I'm sharing? If I pop that up, um, I think that works. Hey, everybody. Uh, great introduction, Ari. It's been a pleasure to, to build COVID Accelerate with, with all of you. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, we had this conversation yesterday talking through with these, with these project creators, like, you know, what was the experience like? What was, what did we see? What's the bigger story here? And, and we just had an incredible conversation there. And I'm, I'm excited to share that with, with all of you today. I think these are really inspiring stories and inspiring people. Um, so to kick it off, I'm going to, uh, let's, let's hear from Paul, who is, uh, he's one of the co-creators, co-founders of the Corona Care Card. Uh, Paul, can you tell us a little bit about what you've, uh, what you've built and, uh, and, and what we're looking at? Absolutely. Thanks, Tito and uh, Ari, and good afternoon in the world. So my name is Paul Huynh. I'm one of the co-founders of Corona Care Card. Um, and before we go into any further, I'd like to give a huge shout out to the Corona Care Card team. We're working from around the globe uh, tirelessly on in, in addition to homeschooling and our day jobs to build something that is meaningful and supportive for, of our local business owners. So what Corona Care Card is, um, you know, like all of our team members, I have a very personal attachment and, and, and love for local business owners. I grew up in the deep south where my mom was an entrepreneur and her manicuring salon was the lifeline of our family. It provided us many opportunities to realize you know, the potential and successes. So um, when we couple that with a lot of the stats we're seeing right now, you know, when we think about the, the roles that, that small business owners play in America, over 30 million businesses fall into that category. Eight million of those are minority owned, right? They create two out of every three net new jobs and they represent 99% of all businesses across America. So when we think about what's happening right now in the pandemic of Corona and COVID-19, um, that doesn't really change the number one major reasons why their businesses might fail. And that's because of cash flow. And that's what we came together to come and solve. How can we help enable and empower these small business owners and local business owners to stay afloat during this pandemic uh, and, and help tackle that, that, that major fear of, uh, of cash flow um, uh, deficiencies. So our platform enables any business owner, especially those without digital presence today, um, believe it or not, nearly 50% of small business owners do not even have a website, right? So we wanted to enable and empower them to come online and sell digital gift cards so that they can, uh, to help with their cash flows during this time when they can't work remotely. I think a lot of us are privileged in the sense that we can, but a lot of these business owners who are selling services, like my mom, are not able to go to their salon. So that's essentially what we're solving today. I'm very excited um, that we were able to bring together a team of committed, passionate, uh, and, and, and just hungry people to solve for, for this, this large challenge that we have here. That is totally awesome. It's been great to, great to watch it all grow. Uh, I wanted to hear from you, what's, what's your perspective on, on an accelerator? How has this model been, uh, been helpful in a time like this? So an accelerator around a pandemic, what's, uh, how has it been helpful? It's been, yeah, it's been helpful. I mean, like I'm, I, I, my background is in tech, right? So I've worked um, over 11, about 11 years with Google. So I, I would, I'm, I'm very honored and privileged that I'm able to tap into that network. But when we think about people who want to solve challenge and, and, and challenges and problems without that network, um, it's, it's quite impossible if you don't have that, right? So the accelerator in this case was able to lend like a credence um, it did like the vetting and, 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 and loaned credibility so that people can come together and focus on that, that mission, that, that vision that they have for whatever problems that they're, they're looking to resolve in this terms of uh, a crisis. So what, kind of, uh, what kind of, uh, like, what kind of emotions have you seen from, from the team and from you, know, from you, as, you as you started to, to today? 
I think what really helped us uh, really gel, right? So we, we put out a call to action. Hey guys, like this is something that we're kind of thinking about. Um, you know, there's gotta be something we can do to help local business owners. Um, and in a time where people are starting to feel a little bit helpless and hopeless, we're wondering like, what is it that we can actually do? What that synthesized for us is like, okay, well now that we wanna do something for humanity, we're feeling a little bit helpless, hopeless, how can we do that? Right, so we brought that all together with one focus, and that focus helped us to to really build out a team, build out a solution that is meaningful and and possibly sustainable for beyond this crisis, and then also in in, in the same vein, build communities, right? And that's what we've been able to to, to do. Um, but the sentiment has been really charged around, like you know, we we have a, a passion, we have a commitment and, and dedication to uh, to helping our 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 neighbors, and that's what it comes down to. Who, who was there when we needed the most? Who provided us that, that study room in their back of the cafe? Who provided us like that, you know, the, the, the extra bottle of milk that we needed when, when salaries were not, you know, uh, coming in on time, et cetera. So that's what we're, what we're rallying behind. It's the communal effort and, and building and propping up our local heroes. That is super awesome. So I wanted to bring in uh, Yi Ying to the conversation. She's the uh, creative director of the, of the Corona Care Card. Uh, Yi Ying, can you can you help us uh, understand from a from a designer's perspective uh, how how you see this uh, how you see this project? Absolutely, yeah. I I think I'll give a bit of background. It's funny because uh, how I uh, started this whole journey so far. It's been less than literally uh, less than two months because uh, Tito and I met uh, in late February. Uh, uh, the next slides would be uh, we were working on um, a lot of different projects together to for the climate change and a more sustainable earth. And then uh, Tito invited me to this uh, uh, Slack channel and it also uh, introduced me to Ari. Uh, so I kind of just stumbled upon the, the the Slack channel, which is the, um, the COVID accelerator, uh, which is sort of leading the effort to have a bunch of experts from different areas. And so the next slide is uh, how Paul and I met virtually. He kind of just dragged me into the conversation. He's like, hey, would you like to join our Google Hangout? It's, it's starting now. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I kind of jump into the, the, the um, it's a, I think it's a Google Hangout. If you look at the, the next slide, you'll see all the happy faces. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the, uh, it's like walking into a bar and it was a bunch of people you've never met. And look, I, I'm like, the only person is kind of clueless. Everybody was like waving. I was just like, looking at <laughs> what's happening here. Um, but my background, I've been working with um, uh, hundreds of startups in the world and also corporate companies. So previously I was the creative director of 500 startups. So working with founders, working with people, creating something new to help the world is always something I'm passionate about. Um, and uh, to amplify the message um, and also making the storytelling, because a lot of times the, te the technology can be amazing. We can have some of the best engineers, we can have some of the best technologists working on the problem. But um, if you look at the next slide, you will see the original, uh, the, this is the original brand design. And I remember uh, Leanne and, and, and Paul and also Mike, uh, like they're kind of like the person who started this uh, movement. They said, oh, you know, we have really great engineers working together on this project but we really need some branding help because we, we wanted to make sure even though this is a new company but we really have people behind it and we wanted to help small businesses but we need to build this trust to um, engage with all the potential donors and people who can support to buy the gift card to help all the small and medium business owners so um, I was looking at it I was like yeah, they, they really need, need some design help. So um, if you look at the next slide, I kind of did a, a little uh, call. So I said, uh, hey guys, like uh, I, I just decided to do this branding exercise. And it's also the first time I'm doing this branding exercise with people I've never even met. I didn't even know how many people are gonna show up. So I kind of just like took the lead. Um, I, I said to myself, yes, I'm gonna just do this uh, virtual exercise and see how many people are gonna show up. Uh, so if you look at the next slide, we had more than like nine people showed up. This is just one of the slides, all the happy faces. So we did an exercise um, and I had all these uh, uh, sort of design questionnaires. Um, it's only one hour, but, but we were like, and most, I, I mean, I've never met any of these people. Some of the people were uh, from, 
from Bay Area, some people are from the East Coast. We also have um, a girl from Colombia, uh, Vanessa, and it was just really amazing. Everybody was so um, devoted to this project, even though we've never met each other, but within that hour, we, we, we not only established trust, but also um, established this almost like a professionalism that uh, normally you wouldn't be able to see like within an hour, you'll be able to like gel real fast. Um, and it was a really interesting session as well. So if you look at the next slide, uh, I was showing, uh, this is, uh, I, I think I hacked uh, right after our design session was at one o'clock, we finished at two. I took some break and also some meetings and I, I kind of finished dinner and I hacked for like two or three hours. Um, I was able to, um, work on, because usually I don't have the luxury uh, to, I, I was mentoring a lot of companies, but I don't have the luxury to really kind of work on things. But it was amazing that it was just so much energy after the call. So I was working on the colors and also um, based on everybody's um, determination of the keywords. Uh, we have, if you look at the next slide, you'll be able to see uh, all the colors and I have three options. Everybody was giving feedbacks in real time. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see uh, Fadumo just said, I love it. Looks like the first one is going to be the winner. Let me build, I started to build the branding guide. And you look at the next slide, you will see uh, she started to just like, this is nine o'clock in the evening, right? So I sent her all the files. And you, if you look at the next slide, uh, within like three hours in 1 a.m., she already built this entire branding style guide based on the raw files that I sent her. And then the next day when I woke up, um, if you look at the next slide, you will see Vanessa from Columbia built the entire UI, the front end, um, with all her work uh, just in the last you know, seven hours when, when I was in bed. And uh, about, a, about 10 days later, um, the next slide will show uh, about 10, day, uh, 10 days later, we have a website. We also have you know, the, um, the, the mobile phone version as well. So it was amazing, just this entire sort of uh, twin around and also just how rapidly prototyping and rapidly we work together. I think the takeaway is often artists uh, don't think about they have a role playing in solving uh, global challenges like a coronavirus pandemic. Right now, the medical workers are the soldiers in a war zone, but we also do, and we can work magic. Visual communication is not just something nice to have. Instead, it is a responsibility that artists uh, and designers uh, and communicators must to take on to, com to convey the communication and tell the powerful human stories through visuals. Um, and I believe that will also help to solve some of the biggest problems in, in the planet currently facing. So thank you so much. And I'm so glad and so grateful to be able to work with this amazing team um, and just to see how much human potential we have. And, and also sometimes it just, follow your gut instinct and say yes to things. I still haven't met Paul in person today, but we've been working <laughs> <laughs> in the last three weeks and it was such a blessing to be able to be, um, also feel like, you know, something we can provide, we can help, uh, we can work together as, as a unity. So thank you for having me. We're not worthy. Thank you so much, Yi Ying. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That is totally awesome. Great, great working with all of you. Um, next, I wanted to I wanted to hear from somebody who is on the on the front lines. Uh, Nana, I would love to hear more more from you about um, your experience, Doctor A. Uh, you know, building out the uh, building out COVID MB. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you've uh, what you've built and what problem you're solving? Yes, hi. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm still in awe at what Corona um, Care Card has said, and a lot of the words that Ying Yang um, had mentioned just resonated with me so much. And um, I think using it from the lens of medicine, science, engineering, that spirit where you just want to connect um, with that talent and that human um, it's, I think it's that universal language that you can't, I just, it just, it, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, what, what, what ship you're, you're, you're sailing with, we all see each other. So thank you guys so much for what you guys are doing and just putting yourselves out there. Um, 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 uh, me being just um, feeling a sense of despair um, 
I um, come from an uh, immigrant background. My mother was one of 14 brothers and sisters um, in, from Ghana. She was the only one to get an education and come to the US and then um, started a life for herself as a critical care nurse and midwife and created a pipeline of people, immigrants who were just trying to come through the US and um, get their foot in. And so I grew up with probably about 13 um, um, foster step, what you call it, brothers and sisters and aunts because our house was the pathway through, you know, to just getting a footing. And when she passed away, when I was in college, I, I went to college at UCLA, I was so angry. I was just like, wait a minute, she was one of the soldiers. Why would this, why would she go out so quickly? And so I be, put my soldier hat on and was, I was committed to social justice in the area of medicine and wanted to focus on how to um, bring healthcare equity because I felt that the reason why she passed was because at her access to care in our community was not like any other community. And so I did that. And then I saw some of the constraints working in medicine. There's so many highs and so many lows when you are connected to the community and you're working within a health system, you just, um, as an individual doctor, you get torn. And so I went and pursued a degree in public health. I went to Columbia and started focusing on um, population medicine and, and um, uh, refugee um, work and started working with uh, several NGOs and humanitarian work, um, crises work overseas. And then I quickly realized that, you know, if you have a bunch of student loan debt, you can't be flying around doing all that, right? So you gotta get a job. <laughs> <laughs> and the humanitarian space is not forgiving when it comes to financial health, you know? And so I was also, you know, my soul was torn and I ultimately ended up um, securing um, work here in, in a wonderful hospital, but I had to put that, that hat aside. Um, and so when, um, but I also felt like there were more and more people as the student debt crisis became much more alarming, more and more people were feeling destitute, more feeling like they had these skills, but they were feeling shackled by it. And so I launched something called Shared Harvest Fund, um, which was an opportunity to connect people who had student debt with volunteer opportunities so they, they can elevate themselves and the creative spirit, help a nonprofit, and then our fund would be paying down their student debt. And as this, um, event COVID MD came on being also emergency doctor working in the front line, I saw that uh, once again, that huge gap in our safety net, just um, sounding the alarm while we were having so many people who were uninsured, underinsured, um, homeless, uh, people of color who constantly are um, dealing with the lowest resource communities um, and trying to do the best with the little that they have. Now we have a national crisis, but we're not serving most of the people who are hurting the most. And we're the emergency room that becomes a healthcare safety net is no longer the healthcare safety net for this population because we don't want people coming because it, it harms um, the, the, the providers, it makes the hospital unsafe, um, more people in the ICU because of so many different variables. So I said to myself, you know, it was that awe moment again was said coronavirus is a community acquired infection. It requires a community response, not a hospital response. So uh, I just, I don't even know. I remember the one night I just came home after a hard shift and I literally, I don't even know how I woke up the next morning with like papers everywhere with this vision of connecting the grassroots community to, to the technology space so that we can work collaboratively to bring resources to the community. And I realized it existed already in um, humanitarian settings that I had seen in Haiti um, and in Ethiopia, but now we had this amazing time in our country, in our lives where technology could help, right? And the reality is there's people in the populations that I'm trying to serve that don't even have broadband they don't have um, a smartphone, you know, they're sick and shut in and no one knows how to contact them. So having this amazing, beautiful technology as Yin Yang had said, um, and then it, 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 it's great, but the, the stories and connecting with the people on the ground 
has to be the focus and how to bridge that relationship is so critical. And so what COVID MD, my COVID MD does, um, I can share my um, screen. I oh, we just, uh, we're just gonna do one. Oh, okay. We've got the one slide up. Okay, okay, okay. So what why, my COVID MD is basically, it's an, a safety net with arteries and my COVID MD offers an opportunity to connect any resident anywhere with resources in real time by real people. And what does that mean? That means that um, we um, do pop-up um, pop testing, um, drive-through testing using the model of most hospitals, but we can do them in the communities where churches in the parking lots of churches in the parking lots of schools, in the parking lot of co-working spaces where a lot of entrepreneurs who don't have really solid insurance, people forget a lot of creators don't have insurance. Um, and they're also part of this safety net that we need to um, protect. So we show up there and we provide the screening and testing like you would do at the hospital. But once we show up there, we connect them to what we call a community health partner, which is an online version of um, your, uh, your health coach, nutrition coach, but this is your crisis coach. And this person connects you to resources in your community. They're also the point person that you reach out to when you're feeling in despair. And then we connect our, that community health partners network into our arteries of telemedicine partners. So if you need to see a doctor and we can't get you in to see a doctor because you don't have one, you can get a doctor for, um, for visits through our telemedicine partner Emerge TM. Um, if you need to see a psychiatrist, you're not connected with your psychiatrist because they're not taking appointments. We have um, a connection with our behavioral health and psych. And then our wellness telewell is the same thing is that we as a community know how to use a little that we have and then our communities to make, make ourselves smile, make ourselves laugh, make each other feel better. And so bringing that community aspect, wrapping it into that telehealth um, clinic services is what the telewell piece does. And then the last thing that we awesome. do that's so- Awesome, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, the last thing that we do that's really important um, is that that link to the financial health and well-being. So all of our volunteers, if you can be a CHP, whether you're a provider or um, a, whether you're a doctor or not, and everyone has the opportunity to earn credits and those credits can either go towards a student loan reduction or an emergency savings account. Because we know that at the end of the day, this, fight, this event will pass and we wanna make sure people are financially healthy and sound moving forward. That is totally awesome. Thank you for all the work that you do. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome to see, it, to see it grow and to see you launching these, these events. And if anybody wants to volunteer, uh, you can check out covidmd.org. Um, and, and I think we'll have, we'll have more time afterwards for, for more follow-up. If anybody has any questions, you can, I think, enter them in the chat. But uh, I want to introduce uh, Keith from another project on the COVID Accelerator. This is called Hospital Hero. Uh, Keith, can you tell us a little bit about uh, about what you've what you've built and what problem you're solving? Thanks, Tia. Sure thing. Um, so healthcare workers are really our first line of defense against COVID nineteen, um, and they're also some of the people hardest hit by the pandemic. Um, we saw this really early on in Wuhan, China. Um, with the crisis there. And we're seeing it now in New York um, and soon we're gonna see it everywhere. Um, doctors, nurses, and other hospital workers um, are working really long hours. They don't have access to the supplies they need. Um, and this is not just putting them at risk, but their families as well um, and their patients, right? When doctors are sick, uh, when nurses are sick, it's really hard to stop the spread of this disease. So um, we, um, a group of amazing volunteers uh, got together on um, COVID Accelerator and we decided to create a simple web application called Hospital Hero. Um, and Hospital Hero makes it easy for healthcare workers to post requests for basic needs like hot meals after a long shift, like lodging so they don't have to stay at home where they risk getting their family sick, um, and medical supplies and other things, dog walking, errands, um, whatever they need to stay on the job saving lives. Um, so when a provider signs up, they get a unique link that they can share the request with their social networks because some tasks you only want your, you know, maybe you trust your friends to do. Um, but then they can also, that request can also become like public in a directory where volunteers can go and browse requests in their local community 
um, and respond to the request that they want to help with. Um, so, um, so in terms of like, I guess how people, if anyone's interested in getting involved, um, the easiest ways are to um, share Hospital Hero with your friends. Um, you can sign up to volunteer. And um, we'd also love to get your feedback. This is an MVP, um, like I said, built by an all volunteer team in just two weeks. Um, so it's pretty early days. Um, so we'd love to get your feedback, especially if you have friends who are healthcare workers who still have bandwidth. Um, that's especially valuable right now. We wanna make sure that this is really useful to people so that when the crunch hits in the coming weeks, um, they have a resource that, that they can use to get help. Love it. Yeah, it's been, uh, as, as with all these projects, it's been incredible to see the, see the team come together, see the project come together. Uh, can you share a little bit about has this has this pandemic changed how you think of kind of the fundamentals of, of entrepreneurship? Hmm. Um, yes and no. So I, I, I think, you know, personally, it's been real. It's felt really good to have something I could put my energy into um, while I'm you know trapped here in my house, rather than just like reading the news and feeling helpless about this problem. I think for all of us in COVID Accelerator, it's been really empowering to feel like we could do something, even if it's only um, you know, a very small thing to help. Um, and it's, it's actually been really inspiring to see all this entrepreneurial energy going into these really important problems. Like how do you, how do you build a ventilator that costs $500? How do you sterilize masks and when you have a shortage of supply? Um, how do you have mutual aid uh, networks so that people who it's not safe for them to go to the store because they're elderly or immunocompromised, they can get paired with someone who can help. Um, it's like super impressive and inspiring to see what smart people can do when they like put their minds to solving these problems. Um, and it's, I'm like, you know, every morning I'm like, this is awesome. Like, why can't we do this all the time? Um, and, and I think like, it's really made me think personally about this tension between doing work that's fun and interesting, uh, you know, like working at a, you know, on a fun product, um, doing work that's like important, like personally fulfilling. Um, and doing work that pays the bills. Um, and I think some, you know, for some people don't have the luxury to like make those like choices because they are, you know, really focused on the day to day. Um, and, but for, for, I think particularly for entrepreneurs who do have that privilege and that freedom, um, it's really made me think like about the importance of working on problems that matter. Um, so go to the next slide. Um, actually, I sort of have been on a bit of this journey myself over the last nine months. I started, um, I left the um, startup world to, um, to run marketing at Give to Asia, which is a international NGO that works on funding local charities um, in the Asia Pacific. So 23 countries uh, um, across the region. Um, and actually it was because of that work at a nonprofit that we um, had this window into what was happening really early days with coronavirus. So we were watching what was happening to healthcare workers in Wuhan, watching the local organizations um, scramble to try and support these healthcare workers and in a pandemic, there's all these new challenges like, you know, travel is restricted. And so it's really hard to move goods and logistics becomes really important and nonprofits don't necessarily have supply chain expertise. So you saw all these cool partnerships emerging um, between corporations and nonprofits, between local volunteers um, and larger organizations because the local volunteers had access to like, they knew what each hospital needed. Um, and it became really apparent how important the technology was to coordinate resources um, in a crisis, but probably in, in, in general as well. Um, so I think like the silver lining of this, um, of this crisis is hopefully, uh, one of them is getting entrepreneurs like all the folks on this call to really think like about what you're doing um, and like is and how you can apply your skill sets to problems that actually matter. Um, I think in, in tech, there's this real temptation to just build build fun things that VCs want to fund. Um, but the reality is that like, if you're, if you're successful, like the best case scenario, you're going to spend the next 10 years of your life building this thing. Um, so I think it's really important to build things that matter, especially if you have that, that privilege. Um, there are just so many problems out there um, that actually can be solved by technology. Not all of them, um, but certainly some of them. So decarbonizing the economy to fight the climate crisis, um, improving access to safe water and food in the developing world. Um, lowering the cost of healthcare solutions. Like we have great healthcare, but it's not evenly distributed. Um, there's just like so many cool opportunities out there. Um, so I hope that folks on this call and 
um, really think about what you can build with your skills that will matter. Awesome. Thank you, Keith. Well said. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see where those kind of those those thoughts and threads uh, end up over the next six months or year and and see how, you know, how will the the COVID outbreak change people's change people's careers, change people's jobs. Um, that turns out to be a good segue to uh, John Potter, who's building a website called findcovidjobs.com. Uh, hey, John, uh, do Hello. you want to tell us about Find COVID Jobs and, uh, and what you've built? Yeah, so you can see the website itself is very simple. I built it in about a week on Webflow uh, to start. And right at the top, there's a job board you can click uh, to see an easy integration with Easy Hire that we have right now to organize our jobs and candidates more. Uh, but mostly what people use on the website right now is not the job board, but the buttons below here. So you could see submit resume or submit jobs, depending on if you're an employer or an applicant. Uh, the only in-person jobs that we hire for, or like try to match for rather, are essential sort of most heavy hit sectors like grocery stores or uh, certain types of healthcare jobs. Uh, and related industries, some maintenance jobs, things like that. And then we've also been focusing on full stack uh, remote jobs, as you can see at the bottom there. So I've gotten a lot of responses from engineers that want remote jobs right now. And we've also gotten a pretty good response from the employer side for the hiring managers. So I'm going to read an excerpt just very quickly uh, from one of our submissions we got on the hiring side. Uh, they say they work for the state government, mostly social service and healthcare roles, but also support IT and management. Most hiring decisions are completed within three weeks from advertisement start date, so they need to hire relatively quickly. And then they included their LinkedIn and some other information. Um, on the applicant side, we've gotten great results, not just from engineers, uh, but from all over. People submit their portfolios if they're a designer or if they do other work that needs to be showcased that way. They submit their LinkedIn for that as well if they're an applicant. Um, on the engineer side for jobs we've actually matched, uh, we recently matched an engineer that used to work at WeWork and a few other places to a startup in Mountain View um, called Deal, D-E-E-L, which focuses on payroll management uh, for remote workers, oddly enough, interestingly. So that's where we're at. And the growth is really quite incredible. And really, the thing that I want to focus on right now to tell you all about is just it on paper, I made the website myself, and I don't have any co founders. Uh, but the COVID accelerator was able to link me up with a lot of volunteers, and a lot of mentors and resources that made me able to move much faster than I otherwise would have been able to. Uh, yeah, example, that's, I, I remember you talking about that yesterday. Like, yeah, can you talk about uh, maybe how you see the, the difference between developing a product normally, yeah. which is always, which is always a fast pace. It's always like, let's, let's mm -hmm. get this launched. But how's that, how's that different uh, now during a pandemic? Yeah, so the most striking difference I've noticed recently is after thinking about it some more, Asking for things is way different right now. So normally when I ask for things uh, in a business development sort of way or in a sales or marketing sort of way, it's different than it is now, you know, to say the least. So we reached out to Slack and Webflow and a couple other companies to ask for discounted uh, software or for credits, extended free trials, any, anything they could offer. And we got incredible responses. Webflow gave us some free hosting and uh, other business plan uh, credits for free. Same thing with Slack. And all it took was us or COVID Accelerator reaching out to a couple different companies and saying, here's where we're at, here's what we're working on. Uh, here's some other companies that have helped us. Would you please consider extending our free trial? And then sometimes they'd give us more than we asked for even. Uh, so it's very encouraging, very surprising. And the volunteers that have helped, the designers, the engineers, the project managers that have helped and joined our, our Slack group to, uh, not the COVID Accelerator Slack group, but 
our um, separate Slack group for findcovidjobs.com. It's been incredible how much help, how skilled the volunteers are. Even, you know, some people think only technical volunteers can help, but anyone can help. There's so much work that needs to be done and, and people have such a wide variety of skills. Uh, it's helped immensely. And I didn't even start out doing this website. That wasn't my first project in the COVID Accelerator. I, I pivoted from my, my first idea was to have a podcast that could sort of market and advertise these other projects and the COVID Accelerator itself and, and maybe partner with other podcasts so they could do the same. Uh, but when I asked people about the jobs idea, they were much more excited. They gave a lot more feedback. They smiled a lot more. It's just clear to me anyway that something about the jobs problem really just struck a deep chord with people and excited them uh, to want to help fix the problem or alleviate the problem. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. I think we've seen that that theme of, of like people kind of jumping in and uh, taking the lead on something, but then it just it sort of start, it just shifts to something completely differently. But it really it's it's about taking an idea and stepping out with it and saying, hey, I'm going to do something that seems to that seems like it just brings so much momentum to um, to a project. I realize my video looks like it's frozen. Um, <laughs> Yeah, lots of momentum. Really, the other thing that's helped is I try to work on it every day, uh, even if I can't work on it that much that particular day. And I've noticed the volunteers, they get excited by seeing their work turn into real progress and in a fast way, because everyone wants to try to help now. They don't want to help three months from now, right? So they want to see the results of their, their volunteer efforts quickly. So I've tried to update the website. I've tried to match more people every day and we're growing pretty quickly. So I'm, I'm just trying to manage that all and, and figure out what's next and just keep going. Awesome. I want to uh, bring in Tessa next to talk about uh, her work kind of on the, more on the, on the organizing side. Um, yeah, hi. Um, hey, Tessa. Hi. I also have this slide up of lessons learned from COVID Accelerator in case those are those are helpful later. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I'm Tessa Brown. I am in San Francisco. I'm a lecturer at Stanford. I teach writing and research there, and I'm a literacy researcher. Um, and so I came into the Accelerator not knowing anybody. I found it on Twitter, as I find so much stuff that I do. Um, and I came in with an idea for an app um that you know was based on some community organizing principles it's called organizer so stay tuned um and i'm still thinking about that but really where my energy has been over the past few weeks has been on the accelerator itself um and it's just been such an incredible learning opportunity for me i'm an academic i've spent the last 10 years you know in classrooms with students and in the academic structure which you know has given me an amazing opportunity to learn a lot about social media i teach courses about social media i talk to my students who are always you know i get older but they stay the same age so they're always, you know, working with whatever new digital communication technologies are popular at that time. And I think a lot about these things, but I, I'm not in an entrepreneurial environment, right? I'm in academia, like the longest institution, the oldest institutions in the world besides like the church. Um, so being in the accelerator has been an incredible way for me to learn myself about this environment, but also to think about what the skills that I've had from teaching and from academia can bring and be valuable over in this environment. And so, you know, instead of building an app to connect communities, I've really been just working on connecting our community in the accelerator. Um, and I got really involved really fast. You know, one of the great ironies of this experience has been that we're all alone in our homes or mostly alone. And yet these new communities have sprung up out of nowhere. Um, 
the people that are on this call right now, I've seen some of them almost every day for a few weeks and I've never met any of them in person, <laughs> except I saw Yi Ying speak once at a conference. Um, so it's pretty wild. And um, I think, you know, something that I've been realizing is that just the value of communication skills, you know, I teach communication. And so I've been able to bring that over to this group and help people connect with each other, um, help people just be outgoing with one another, state what their needs are, state what they're working on, think about deadlines and trajectories and sort of build in um, some sense of regularity. I think that's something that I took from academia and brought over to our group. You know, one of the first things that we kind of instituted together was this daily 10 a.m. Pacific time coffee and COVID. And it's just a Zoom call every day, but just the regularity of it and the community building aspect has been so powerful. Um, there's been an incredible value in just developing one-on-one -on -one relationships. Um, that's an insight from community organizing too. You know, one-on-one -on -one relationships are the foundation of agile response networks, right? So the more of us that know each other individually, the more we'll be able to connect, the more we'll be able to respond to whatever comes up next. Awesome. Uh, I, I love the I love the sense of like inspiration that uh, that comes out of all this stuff. Um, any uh, I, I see we got a, we got a question from a, from the audience that I thought you might have some good some good input on Tessa. When when you think about kind of what comes out of this crisis, right? So we've got these these ideas and projects and and companies spinning out. How how are you thinking about the the longer term um, the longer term impact of this stuff? Is it is it temporary? Is it it, you know, do we, do we go back to like how things were? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm really thinking as a historian that, you know, even when our shelter in place order is lifted, I don't think we're going to go back to how things were before this. And I think this is why it's such an incredible moment for entrepreneurs and, you know, for people that have the will to make stuff. Um, because we're seeing our whole society in a new light. We're seeing how connected we are. We're seeing how much we need each other. We're seeing what kind of work is really indispensable to our society. You know, the doctors, the grocery store workers, um, the drivers that are delivering things. Like, I think we're being granted a glimpse at our future. Um, we're really seeing what we can live without and what we can't and what kinds of needs and capacities people have, you know, when we can't all be in public together or when we want to live in a more distributed way. Um, so I think that the ideas that are being produced now are going to be potent for a really long time. Um, and I think this is a moment to kind of invent for the future that we want. We're seeing what the weak points are in our society and where we need to apply our resources and our attention and our care as a society. Yeah, I love that. Um, does anybody else want to add add some perspective there in terms of how you're thinking about this uh, this longer term impact of, of COVID-19 and, and COVID-19 solutions? Maybe Keith or uh, Nana? Sure. I, mean, I think, you know, some, some of these solutions are, will hopefully be short term, right? Like we have a, you know, an immediate crisis facing us that will, um, that will hopefully be over or at least, um, you know, reduced by several orders of magnitude in a, you know, in a few months. Um, but I, I think there will hopefully be some things that come out of this that are, if nothing else, this is really um, identifying some of our um, collective shortcomings in terms of um, preparation for disasters of this scale. Um, and, and of the, you know, just the, the need, the, needs for improvement in our healthcare system, um, not just here in, this, in the US, but um, worldwide. I mean, we, there's, there's, such a, there's such a gap when you look at the countries that are handling this really well. Um, you look at South Korea, you look at Singapore, places where um, they have a plan, they're executing the plan. It's, it, you know, it's, and it's not like the situation is perfect, but there's real, um, 
you know, th there's really effective solutions. And I think making sure those are more widely distributed is hopefully a long-term, um, you know, uh, outcome from this, um, from this whole project. So I see a question that Ari has raised um, that one of the viewers asked. Um, hey, this can I add to that or? Oh yeah, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say also that um, I think, you know, there's a saying in the African-American community that um, when America um, catches a cold, uh, Black America um, catches the flu. And when we look at it across those communities where um, there are lower resource, they tend to get hit harder when there is a mass issue um, of this magnitude. And I think what is so beautiful about um, having these ecosystems that can get together and see the crisis and want to create impact um, is so powerful, um, but it's also important to be, if we're amongst that ecosystem, to be mindful of the people who aren't able to join that ecosystem because of the lack of opportunity and the, 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 whether it's healthcare disparities or economic disparities that keep um, um, our ecosystem so fragmented. And so the solutions that we make have to also be mindful of that as well. Well, what we end up doing is using technology to create greater and greater rifts within society between the haves and haves not. Um, even in the most midst of crisis, you know? So for example, when you have a system that is focused on, um, I loved, um, this will just be a perfect example of how beautiful the accelerator works. You know, initially um, one of the companies was Feedadoc, right? And the focus was on the doctors at the front lines. And that powerful story of how that, um, that team evolved to um, healthcare heroes and um, in, um, hospital heroes, I'm sorry, uh, to be more inclusive um, was exactly what we're talking about. Really, those of us who are thinking on the technology, how do we advance beyond uh, the, the title here was the virus? How do we get, we'll get, we get past, faster than the virus is by being inclusive, is thinking about everyone who's either at the table or not at the table when we're building these technology solutions. So I think that was just I just wanted to make sure that that's something that was beautiful that just came out of the accelerator to see that. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear here. And yeah, it's, it's wonderful to, to see that too. It reminds me, so there's this there's this question that just came into the, from the audience that I think can kind of tail nicely off of that, which is what's an industry not being focused on right now, uh, but could have a potentially longer term impact that we'll need to start thinking about in the next few months or, or years. Um, do either do, do you have a sense for for that right like in terms of uh inclusiveness and reaching out to new audiences is there a particular uh area or industry where you think that could be potentially people listening right now want to work on something where could they uh what's an area that they could work on i think that fundamentally because of how take we're seeing now the only way our uh, economies that are functioning are online. Fundamentally, building an industry that is focused on getting everybody online, whether it's the utility push for um, broadband being at every community, anywhere in the South, wherever, internationally, building a system where everyone gets online, whether it's um, right now, there is a community, surprising enough, I'll just do an example, in Los Angeles, um, an urban community that the, when the schools went out and um, the most of the schools were online for the students in the high schools, there were students didn't have, um, they don't have internet at home. They were going to the libraries for the internet, but now the li libraries are closed. So there's a segment of um, that school that now are missing out on their curriculum because they didn't have that. And one of the large institutions, um, it took a while, it took a while, but one of, um, I believe Verizon Wine decided to distribute hotspots for communities. Well, that should have been part of the master plan from the beginning, right? Because if you're gonna tell people to go online, you gotta make sure they have access to get online. And so when, I, when we're talking about these like technologies, it should just should be, you know, who is that partner online that to make sure that we grab our hands and make sure the person offline. And we still have 
um, in the geriatric population, we still, even though technology has advanced, we still have to take care of our older population. So what are we doing to bridge the gap in the use of technology to make sure we are reaching our senior citizens in the time of crisis and where emergency response requires that we were watching out for them. So I think, you know, the industry is where interconnection meets in, um, in the intersection between in, um, community and technology and what that is on every industry level. What are they, what is, what is that, what's that sticky thing? So we don't leave anybody behind. Yeah, totally. I love it. And, and for what it's worth, I love working with this group because every time we talk, I, I feel like every, it just has such incredible insight and vision. Uh, and I wanted to turn this la this next question over to, to Ari. Um, oh wait, Tessa has something to add. But you're muted. I was just thinking about what's coming next, that wonderful question of what's next. Something that has come up in our group is resource matching or matchmaking. So especially if we're all at home, how do we find each other? How do we connect with each other? So I think that's something that we're all noticing is kind of matchmaking or um, different kinds of social networks that surface people that we don't know yet is really important. Um, data security is coming up a lot because if we do more and more stuff online, how do we make sure that all of our information is safe? Um, and the last space I would say that we've been talking about is the media and media consumption because people's media consumption has skyrocketed and they're looking for new ways to get access to materials, they're, they need curation. Um, you know, we need DJs and curators and educators to kind of select materials for us, I think, and make it easier for us to access them because everyone is on Facebook right now asking what they should watch next. So those are just a few thoughts about conversations we've been having. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, and John, you had a quick thought on this? Yeah, as far as areas that will be affected in the like coming months and, and maybe even years after all this is you know calmed down. I believe agriculture and just the food industry in general will change a lot, not just how the food is uh, made, but how it's distributed and from where it's distributed. So right now it's very global and interconnected. And a lot of people eat food that isn't necessarily grown near them or eat uh, you know, chicken that isn't necessarily raised near them. And I feel like from a sustainability perspective, uh, not just for lowering emissions or, or those good benefits will, will those industries change, but I feel like agriculture will change significantly because people will be more concerned about logistics and supply lines and food security. That sort of thing. definitely, definitely, and I see Tessa add uh, sustainability and security. We need food from close, close by. Um, so as we're wrapping up this discussion, I wanted to uh, invite Ari back to give her give her thoughts. Ari is one of the best synthesizers I know in terms of pulling pulling everything together. Um, Ari, what, uh, what what do you have to add as we as we close this out? Yeah, so I want to close the loop with what we started with and that was the sense that we're entrepreneurs meaning we're problem solvers and we're risk takers and we recognize when something needs to be done and we don't wait for others to do it and what everyone here has talked about is amazing um, so i'm really honored to be part of this with you um, i think what they were able to do in just a few weeks is mind-blowing and they're still doing it it's an open call to everyone out there as well. Um, you're like us, you know, maybe you just heard about this accelerator or thought or were inspired that you can do something and you can. Uh, please join us on COVID Accelerator. Um, we will welcome you. We will be glad to have you there. And I wanna say something for all of you like looking to get involved and you've just been waiting for that wonderful idea. Um, now is your time. Now is really your time. Um, whether it's doing something right now or you're a thinker over the long term and you're looking for ways that the world will be profoundly different. Um, there was a question here about, um, you know, what, what's being affected. Um, that is 
for you to understand and, and solve for. So what I mean by that is um, things like climate change, like we have this unprecedented chance to see how moving into a digital world is positively impacting climate change. Can you lean into that and start something new? Or a few months from now, most of us will be coming out of our caves and we've never had like two months of social isolation. Think about what are the impacts of that? What are the impacts to you? And what can you create out of that? And so just listen, listen and learn about what's going on. And in the accelerator, you can raise ideas and we will help you turn them into something more. Amazing. So, Thank you so much, COVID. Thank you. Really appreciate Hope everybody's clapping in their living rooms. <laughs> All these great work with you. Yeah, each individual team is doing. <laughs>